Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travellers Podcast. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, fellow footy travelers. It's November. The Footy Travelers Podcast is back with new episodes. Thanks for hanging in there during our production break last month. I'm Colin Martin, and this time I am joined by my faithful footy travel companion, Mike Tyrone. Mike, what's new with you these days? Aside from being just generally stoked for the next month and a half that we're about to have, uh, I really, I don't know. I'm blinded by anything other than the fact that it's November in which we've been waiting for, for four years and what, four months? Something like that. A little extra month on the side or, or several thanks to the reschedule. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, it's, it's World Cup time. It's kicking off in a few weeks. We have our match tickets, our accommodation plans, our flights, our Haya cards, actually spoke with a buddy last night uh, who didn't have his Hyatt card yet. So listeners, if you're one of those people out there with tickets and accommodation, but not a Hyatt card, make sure you get your Hyatt card so you can get into the country. That's important. And that's why we have all of the things. And yet still, and maybe because it's the Qatar World Cup, and we know they like to make fairly last minute changes. We're still not 100% sure how and when we're arriving. This is true. I mean, maybe we're going to take a steamship. I don't know. As long as it's not named the Titanic. <laughs> we will get to that by the end. Uh, explain my little cryptic teaser, I promise. But Mike, I figured today we could bring everyone up to speed on how we got to this moment in the first place. Bring our separate footy traveler origin stories, some still needed closure, and explain really what led us to create the footy travelers in the first place. We definitely need to do that. I think getting that in before our next World Cup journey is precisely what we need to carry this narrative, some say love story, through to present time. So probably more of a must than like a need. I do love your must. Or is it Musk? Uh, no, I don't want to purchase Twitter. Thank you very much. Uh, but I would say for the cooler temperatures these days, my scent is a bit more pleasing to the public. So thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Well, I, I sure hope so. <laughs> so, you know, if you agree, then, you know, in that case, start us off. I think when we left our individual stories, we were both living and teaching in Bangkok, enjoying getting to watch Premier League games while we were out for a night, getting to watch Thailand national team games at Raja Mangala, you know, getting to play ourselves even in a variety of situations and contexts. But where did it go from there? So... I think before the sparks flew and magic happened in Bangkok, it's probably worth noting that our friendship actually started not competing for a spot on the soccer team in college, but competing for a female we both were keen on wooing. Like two red-capped mannequin birds, we frequently were stepping onto each other's toes while trying to court the same female. It was really a friendship codified at the onset by rivalry. Platonic relationships between men is a complicated subject. That is where the origin story truly converged. Wow. Wow. We're, we're going deep into this. Ca ca carry on. Carry on. So back to the footy and the, fo the friendship, because, you know, that I just wanted to make sure that people knew that though this blossoming courtship of you and I started in Bangkok, I've heard a lot of people refer to our relationship as a bromance. It really, we first met when things were maybe a little bit more heated. Mm, mm. But the moment that I would say the footy travelers were born, and this is something that I was just describing to a friend the other day when they asked me, how did the footy travelers start? And I said, it all began in 2008 when I took a trip to the island of Koh Chang, which is a weekend getaway for many Bangkokians. Kun Krum Tep, as they would call them. And I met a couple from South Africa, Lisa and Grant. I immediately asked them if they were excited to be the host country for the 2010 World Cup. And their reaction was not what I anticipated. It was something along the lines of, 
meh, we don't really care about football in South Africa. And I immediately could tell that I was providing a little bit more enthusiasm than they were. And so we weren't necessarily vibing, but I kept asking them questions about it. And I would have liked to believe that my charm and personality beat them into submission to invite me down to South Africa in 2010, when in reality, it was probably just a way for me to stop bugging them and, you know, realize that it was probably just an empty offer. But that's neither here nor there. What matters is what happens next, which is they offered me to stay with them in South Africa. And so in my infinite ignorance, I took that offer from two strangers on a boat in the Gulf of Thailand and conjectured it into being, quote unquote, I'm invited to stay with these lovely people in two years time. What an amazing opportunity this is. These are my new best friends. Whoa, 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 whoa. I thought I was your best friend. Well, you know, I got a little bit carried away, okay? We needed, you know, we, it, we still needed to bond, I guess, into that. You're right. The, com- the competition, the rivalry over the lady in college who yeah. hadn't, hadn't overcome that yet. This is true. This all right, is true. all right. Okay. Yep, I, I interrupted again. I'm sorry. Carry on, carry That's on. That's okay. That's okay. So, you know, the way I look at it is sometimes being a blissfully oblivious child of the world and each stranger is a potential couch to crash on can have its perks too. And so... I got back to Thailand and slammed a few dozen beer towers with my man Colin here. White girl wasted. Yes, before it even existed. And so we would frequent bars at the Assumption University campus where I lived. And that night we headed back for some late night drinking at my apartment where I tell Colin about my new friends that I made in Koh Chang. I didn't tell him that they were my best friends, just friends. It's a good move. And yeah, you know, I didn't want to like sour anything. But the big news that I wanted to share with him was that we should go to South Africa for the 2010 World Cup. Now, in true Colin fashion, his level-headed and woefully logical self stifled my excitement. You're sure they offered you to let you stay with them in South Africa? Do you even know what city they live in? Did you get their contact information? You know, just total... Uh, Details. I just, you know, I wanted more details. That's all, I think. Just wanted to know. Getting the info. (sighs) You know, if 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 listeners, if you haven't been able to tell yet by now, Colin is the buzzkill. Oh. I am the full, I am the buzz fill. We will see when we meet our fellow footy travelers and listeners at the World Cup. We'll we'll let them be the judge. All right, listen, we're, we're turning this into to competition again, Mike. <laughs> I'm I'm going to be the most be, fun footy traveler. Don't don't be offended. It's 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 why we work so well together. And so let me, you know, let me give you the grace that you deserve, which is by contrary to many other times in my life where your sensibilities proved out to be correct, this time the rosy colored glasses prevailed because I did confirm with Lisa and Grant that their offer to host me and now my friend Colin that I'm inviting was very much real and it was authentic. And so the planning for Colin and I to go to the World Cup immediately commenced that night. Like giddy little children being told they could stay up an hour later past their bedtime, we started making a plan for how we were going to go to the 2010 World Cup, which I will now dub that moment the Assumption University Assumption. Oh, see what I did there? I see what you did there. Yeah, like a decision, kind of like a treaty, but like more than a treaty. Like we assumed we were going. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So that's just that's my lead in. That's the that's the um, the watershed moment, you may call it the birth of said footy travelers. And uh, I think it yielded pretty well come two years later. Did it not? I you know, I would say so. So two years later, we do wind up at our first World Cup in South Africa. We applied with some other friends. Uh, I think we had four applicants total, at least four. And wound up getting eight or nine games for the whole tournament. And just, I mean, had a great time exploring the country, going to some of the, uh, you know, top tier international games, I'd say. You know, uh, games that come to mind for me are, you know, uh, Brazil, Ivory Coast. I think we saw Spain. I think we saw Portugal. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Argentina. Was coming out. Um, Messi. We saw Italy. Yeah. We saw France. Exactly. We saw your underpants. We saw no pants sometimes, um, depending on yeah. if we knocked or not on the door. But <laughs> the point is, um, for me at least, it was this combination, not just of going to soccer games and experiencing top-level soccer. It was traveling. 
It was meeting new people. It was seeing, you know, iconic landmarks like Table Mountain and going to visit Robben Island where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for so long. I don't know what like what were some of your highlights, I guess, specifically, other other than some of those things I just mentioned. So Cape Town is one of the most marvelous cities I've ever been to. The, the Cape of Good Hope is incredible and it's beautiful and, and scenic. And then Stellenbosch and Franschhoek, where the, the great wines of South Africa come from. So, I mean, this trip in itself, because it offered so many great things aside from the football, was just like it was written in the stars kind of thing. And the fact that we both had so much time to travel because we were in between sort of big moments in our lives. It was just, it felt like we started out with a bang and we, we, we just needed to to be able to recreate that every four years, if not more often. Yeah, I so mean, that, I, sorry, at, at that point in your life, you were just coming off of two years of, of teaching, but I had actually come back to the States and got another teaching job. So I had the summer off. Uh, and so, you know, I know I at least had six weeks uh, of travel available. I think I circled the country twice, actually. You were there maybe earlier and did a side trip. Yeah, I mean, I had I had what I am claiming to be one of the most absurd four weeks, six, no, really like two, three months leading up to this World Cup and then moving into it. Ones that I feel like I would consider the main storyline of perhaps the the memoir that I may be writing or maybe not be writing. I don't know. I'm not doing much writing anymore. But yeah, the side trip to Lesotho to visit a friend from college was pretty incredible. And it, you know, actually happened to have a uh, pretty horrific car accident while there too. So that's pretty fun. But got to see it a really cool country that many people don't even know exists. You have a, a strange sense of fun, my friend. Yeah, fun. Uh in some capacity, uh, life threatening and terrifying in others. You know, it's uh, it's fun to tell the story now. Yeah, looking back at it, it's uh, much more of an interesting story than when it was. And I and I do recall writing this story out in a very thorough email to my family and friends, and not letting them know that I actually got out of that car accident in one piece until the very end. So just like the dramatic, cryptic writer that I am, everyone was very frustrated with me in the fact that I uh, I buried the lead, as you would say. Well, maybe they but, picked up some good uh, speed reading skills that day. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, I mean, the highlights are just like there's so many heavy hitters in terms of the the amount of great places we went, the incredible food that we had, delicious wine, the vistas, the crazy instances of getting ourselves into and out of pickles left and right. It's kind of like, I don't know, I, I, I struggle to to summarize it in one one fell swoop other than just like one of the most well-rounded and dynamic trips we've we've ever taken and I've ever taken. Yeah. I mean, again, when you mentioned well-rounded, it wasn't just the football, the soccer, it was the traveling. It was seeing the sights, Kruger National Park. Uh, my side trip was Mozambique, got to surf there. That was exciting. Went on to a game reserve with a buddy from study abroad's uncle who ran it in this place just outside of Port Elizabeth. So yeah, I mean, once in a lifetime for sure, except for the fact that it inspired us to just keep going so that it wasn't once in a lifetime. And we actually met a few other people, at least one really good friend, I think, that got the same bug, got the same idea. You're talking about our good friend Scott, who I feel like we we mention a good amount on this pod, and it'll be it'll be a beautiful day when we get him on this pod because that guy has ten books of stories to to share with us. So we uh, we may just need to make our own podcast for him. Well, let's. I want to use him as our segue to our next World Cup experience because he did something absolutely fantastic and brilliant as far as i remember it and he when he gets on the pod may clarify my memory but brazil 2014 is coming up we're making plans to keep it going the experience of going to the world cups so is scott and he just he takes it one step further we talked about you know going to south africa kind of where we were in our lives how convenient that was and it sounds like scott was at a point in his life where he wanted to get an mba and he wanted 
to focus on international business, I think. So he went and he searched for a program. And part of their requirement was to go live for a semester abroad and do an immersive language experience. He timed it and chose such that come World Cup Brazil 2014, his immersive Portuguese experience had him living in Rio during the summer of 24, well, the Northern Hemisphere summer of 2014, and just simply being there, getting his degree and living in Rio for the World Cup, not having to worry about all the, the travel issues that, that we had to worry about. And, you know, getting tickets and meeting people and connecting with local Brazilians. And most importantly, having a spot where we could once again come crash uh, and spend time and, and just hang out and party with him again and get to more games and, and see a new country. Again, that's at least my memory of, of his play and something I'll always kind of admire and be grateful to him for. Um, I mean, is that fairly accurate in your memory as well, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I I was going to say even just that first trip to South Africa, we met a lot of really great people. And and I think it just makes sense that even like thinking back to Lisa and Grant, who got us really that first spark to get to South Africa, it always comes from a connection with someone. And, you know, you both just are on the same wavelength and you want to, you know, continue spending time together or, or, or kind of riding the high of the world cup together. And so we met Scott in South Africa and that carried through to several many years in world cups and continents later. And even some other guys that I met in, or we met, we connected as U S fans. And then I got to get a ride with them to the knockout round stage in South Africa for, uh, the U S versus Ghana match. And like, I didn't have that ticket and randomly just bumped into someone that was a US fan started talking and I mean this is the this is the aura of the footy travelers right like this is the DNA that we kind of talk about which is you know you go to these places you're meeting a bunch of people and you all kind of have this shared experience and connect in some way and Scott's a perfect example of that and and it's just like those connections don't come artificially they come from an authentic place. You are connecting in some way. And then, you know, fortunately, we've create really good friendships. And, uh, you know, that one with Scott really yielded some awesome memories and, and be able to give us a place to crash in Rio. And I mean, it was we were riding on his, you know, genius that you <laughs> that he, you know, put forth to, to stay in Rio. But I would say that the differences between the two World Cups were pretty pretty significant. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to I want to talk about those differences because, you know, I think you used the phrase rosy colored glasses uh, somewhere uh, in the beginning of this episode. And having had such a great experience in South Africa, I think we went into Brazil with those glasses just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it was a combination of the fact that it was hosted in Brazil and our approach to getting tickets or you know, not getting tickets too far in advance, that kind of led us to have less games to go to. Do you want to talk about kind of the difference there with tickets, or? Yeah, I mean, even just in the cultural attitude of it too, right? Like, not a lot of people were very excited about South Africa hosting the 2010 World Cup. I mean, that country is predominantly a cricket and rugby country, whereas you go to Brazil and it is the one thing. <laughs> Like it is bigger there than any other country. It is the Mecca for the the fanaticism of soccer. And that showed in the demand for the tickets. You know, we had eight or nine matches that we saw in South Africa. We only got two in Brazil. And ahead of the tournament, but, you know, going through the, the, the channels, going into the lottery, applying for tickets. Yeah, not not a huge success in, in getting them ahead of time. But we, you know, we were still hopeful, I think, in my from my memory, my perspective, that we would just get tickets while we were there. And I guess we had some opportunity to. They were just so uh, expensive. You know, people were trying to scalp tickets for an Argentina game or a Chile game with obviously the, the ease that those countries' fans can get to Brazil with, um, you know, driving up the demand, driving up the price. And our, our plans to scalp basically were, were fruitless, straight up. Yeah. I mean, I think we improvised well. 
We got to watch a lot of good matches in some really cool places. We went to to Sugarloaf to like a watch party, which was really cool. You know, we saw Fan Fest for the U.S. Ghana match on Coco Cabana Beach. We did Iguazu, Iguazu Falls, which was amazing. Didn't have any reference to football, but it was an awesome side trip. You know, ate a bunch of feijoada. I went to Manaus and went into the Amazon for a couple days. Uh, we played some footy on the beaches in Natal on the sand dunes. I mean, once again, very well-rounded trip. Maybe didn't have as many live, in-person, in-stadia um, experiences, but we had some really great football experiences outside of those stadia. And that's... Some footy you know, travel of- experiences. Exactly. And that's that's the whole... That's the whole part of it, right? It's one big party. And if you want to find a place that knows how to party, it's Rio, it's Brazil, you know, during the World Cup. It is, you know, it's the recipe for the biggest party in the world. And that's not to say we didn't go to any games in stadiums. Um, I love the use of your Latin, by the way, Stadia. Well done. Thanks. Um, You know, obviously, if you've seen our Instagram account, you've seen the USA flag onesies. Uh, that we wore to Brazil and continued to wear in other countries. Maybe not the best choice of material for those onesies because uh, it was hot. But yeah, got, got very to... thick knitted cotton in the the very humid parts of Brazil. Just I wouldn't say we didn't plan it right because no one was really making these full blown onesies. But yeah, they got a bit steamy. They might have served us better at the recent qualifier. Uh, for the U.S. up in, I think it was Minnesota, when people's beers were freezing. But nonetheless, uh, did get ourselves to the USA-Germany game. I believe that was in Hesife. Uh, yes. Natal saw us in the stadium for Italy and Uruguay, which, if you remember that game, fellow footy travelers, saw the infamous biting of Luis Suarez on Giorgio Cellini. Or Chiellini, or Chiellini. I don't know how I don't know how you say Italian names to be honest. I, and actually, I don't I don't really fucking care. Wow, he's he cursed about it. So he's cursing my heritage. Just the thought, it's just the, just the thought of the Italian national team just you know twists my stomach a bit. Anyway, um, I could go on about that, but I'll I'll pause there. Yeah, I'm going to let you cool off for a bit. One other thing that is one of my favorite memories is of that brazil trip was we hiked up the the christ the redeemer to the christ the redeemer statue on corcovado mountain also quite steamy but you know we like to be active and we get to the top and it is packed with people (laughs) and i and i feel like you've probably heard me tell this story a bunch a bunch of times but it's one of my favorites and it's the when people ask me which fan base is the most fun that we've met in all these world cups and it's the Chilean fan base. And it's because the uh, Brazilian national television, you know, TV coverage was at the Christ Redeemer statue, the very famous one that, you know, everyone recognizes of Rio. And this very well put together female is doing a uh, doing a live shot with the the statue in the background. And she goes through her first few lines and then like this wave of Chilean fans come behind her and they just go, chi, 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 le, 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 viva Chile. <laughs> and so then they cut it because it obviously ruins the shot and they they bicker a little bit and then, you know, everyone cools off <laughs> and then she goes back into her second try and they do it again and they do it again. And I'm pretty certain she didn't even get the shot because they just... <laughs> They wanted to take over and they that just that memory is seared in my mind. I don't know why. I just thought it was wholesome and funny. And they really are some of the best fans. And when they when they don't qualify for the World Cup, it makes me sad because I do think that they're really fun. Well, if we're talking about Chileans, I think my favorite memory of the Chilean fans beyond that chant was their reputation for passing out drunk on the buses and trains. (laughs) <laughs> that that ran 24 hours and uh w- they were simply found there in the morning you know riding the loop of whatever train or bus route <laughs> they they fell asleep on it, it we heard it from a few different people uh stories of of them coming across someone waking them up uh letting them know that it was the next day and having to uh kind of explain to that passed out Chilean where and when they were so good you know good for them they raged 
and 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 I do and I do recall um, speaking of you know non um, live in the stadium uh, experiences. I, I remember an incredibly gutsy and valiant effort by the U.S. men's national team against which was the up and coming new nation in the World Cup, uh, Golden Childs of Belgium, and Timmy Howard standing on his head making the most saves in one single game in a world cup and watching that on in the, the tiny little square in Manaus. And I, I just remember it being like, man, I'd really love to be in the stadium right now, but at the same time, it's a pretty cool vibe watching it with, you know, a mix of Brazilians and all these other fans that were also kind of doing the same thing I was doing, which was, you know, you're in Brazil. When's the next time you're going to go to Brazil? You got to try to get to the Amazon and, Manaus is the gateway to the Amazon. So we're all sort of, once again, on this shared journey, you know, relating to people, sharing drinks and in moments. So that trip, though very different than South Africa, uh, still really just really remarkable. And, you know, as a kid growing up, dreaming of getting to Brazil, I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would get there and be there for a World Cup, which, I mean, it all kind of came back to me, which is the reason I was obsessive over Brazil was the 94 World Cup final against Italy and how incredible they were and how I wanted to be Brazilian. And so it just felt appropriate that we were there for the World Cup as well. Well, I mean, speaking of, you know, childhood dreams or or, or never thinking that you're going to get to a place maybe is the better uh, segue there, but never thought I'd go to Russia. And uh, you know what? The U.S. men's national team uh, didn't. But, <laughs> but, but there we were, finding ourselves in 2018 going to the Russian World Cup. You know, probably more similar to the Brazil experience than the South African experience. You know, like Brazil, Russia, huge country. Pretty difficult to get around. Huge. The huge. biggest. You know, you can't drive around it twice in, in six weeks. A lot of flights. Our approach here. And especially because the U.S. didn't make it, I think it made it a lot easier. But our approach was to just go to Moscow and St. Petersburg and just kind of lock ourselves into the two biggest, uh, you know, main cities that had the most touristy things to do. We weren't, you know, we weren't going to follow a team around. And so we picked those cities and picked some time and then applied specifically to games that we knew would be in those two cities. And quite honestly, I think that was a great approach, given the fact that we didn't really have to travel to follow a specific national team. I think we wound up getting ticketed for three games. We got to connect with, you know, our old pal Scott. Um, and we made a lot of new friends too, actually. You know, I remember, I, I think it was a buddy of yours from Baltimore, John. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Connecting with him and then making friends with some of the connections he made while he was out at games and, and, and going out at night. Amro from Hong Kong comes to mind. And if we're talking about, you know, some of the females of our past, um, and I can bring it up because you brought it up earlier, you know, <laughs> maybe some of us met some lovely lady friends along the way. I don't know. Is that, am I, is that all, is that off limits here? Or what do we, have I no, gone too I mean, far? We're, we're speaking truths, you know, and uh, Sp I enjoyed spit my your time. truth. Spit your truth. I enjoyed my time in Russia quite thoroughly and met some lovely people, some of which that I, you know, had uh, shared experiences with beyond the football field. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Because you're and a gentleman. Yes, of course. But like any of our trips, it's just an aspect of getting out there and being open to whatever sort of comes our way. Not to say that we had a you know, a very strict agenda or anything that we were doing. But when we had days to explore and partake in the fun and festivities, we let those moments kind of carry us. And, you know, the first 24 hours in Moscow are probably the wildest and most interesting 24 hours I've ever had consecutively. And if you want to hear more about it, there is a uh, a whole other podcast that we uh, talked about this that we started a few years ago. This is and, true. Uh, this is true. I'll let you give the plug because that is that was your brainchild. Well, yeah. Um, you know, if we're plugging more Fiper Media Productions, ladies and gentlemen, check out Counterspective, whose first season was essentially a, a recall of Mike's and my experience in Russia for the World Cup, looking at Russia 
not so much from that geopolitical lens that we always hear about it from, uh, but just through the lens of World Cup tourists. I, I do actually, though, I, I feel like our fellow footy travelers would really appreciate the story of the best 24 hours we've ever had at a World Cup happening in Russia. And I'd love you to tell it. And then maybe let's work our way backwards and just really give our number one experiences in Brazil and then the best World Cup moment we've ever had, ever, ever in South Africa. Okay. I will try to do this justice. So best 24 hours we've ever had at a World Cup. It happened in Russia. Take it away. It's been a while, so you may have to to fill some white spots in this story. But the 24 hours clock essentially starts as we get to Spartak Stadium to see Belgium. The fact that the United States had not qualified, Belgium was the team that I really wanted to see play. They uh, the, the Chelsea team was essentially half of the squad was on the Belgium nation, national team. And my favorite player, aside from Eden Hazard, was Mishi Bashuai. And that game was everything I wanted it to be and more. Tons of goals, lots of excitement. Mishi gets the score. Pretty certain he saw my jersey, like the only person in the stadium that probably has his jersey. And from that moment, people thought that we were Belgian because uh, we were obviously rocking Belgium jerseys. So we're taking pictures with people and other Belgian fans. Speaking no Flemish along the way. Or, or French. And if I recall, they were playing Algeria, was it? It was Morocco or Tunisia. It was not Algeria. Oh, it was Tunisia. It was Tunisia. You're right. It was Tunisia because they also speak French there. And one of their fans spoke French to me kind of in like a banter way because we were wearing Belgian jerseys. And then he spoke to me in English and he said, you're not even a Belgian fan. I was like, how do you know that? And he was like, because I just spoke to you in French and you didn't respond. It's like, damn. So we were playing imposter syndrome the whole time, but it uh, it kind of played out well for us. So leaving that stadium, heading towards Nikolskaya Street, which was like the main street with a bunch of places to watch more games. And we kind of are just like roaming around some of the side streets in Moscow and we stumble upon this wedding. And I'm more so more so the people attending the wedding and waiting for the bride and groom to get done their photos. Right. And they had popped some just, bottles and we were walking by and I think we made some type some type of comment or a head nod or congrats and immediately were invited to drink with the whole wedding party. And, you know, one thing Russians love inviting you to drink with them. This by is the way. true. This is true. And, you know, one thing led to another. We're taking a picture with the guy from the KGB. Uh, we get to p- take a picture with the bride and groom. We're doing toasts of champagne and shots of vodka. So really just a, a, a beautiful little side jaunt from where we were originally going. It was probably like, what, 90 minutes to two hours of just like random hanging with this Russian wedding party. Just street side champagne sipping. Yeah. And so even with that, you know, crash a wedding, that in itself is a pretty damn good story. But it didn't even like scratch the surface of what was to come. So we got the information from some of the people that we were partying with at this wedding to say, you know, we got their phone numbers and so forth. And they were going on like a boat cruise and they said they're going out later. So we should meet up with them. So we're like, okay, sure. Who We didn't know where our night was headed. So we get to Nikolskaya Street and we meet up with our friend John, who met some friends uh, of his and they had met some people along the way. Uh, everyone's drinking Aperol spritzes and we get to see some amazing soccer matches. And in that time, I may have charmed the the likes of... Hands off. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that too. Uh, charmed the likes of uh, one Russian female. So we were, all of us just having a, a very good time walking down Nikolskaya Street, having people hand us shots of vodka because they thought we were on the Spain national team or they thought we were Spanish because we were wearing a red jersey. I, I think I was asked to sign the back of a Spanish <laughs> national team jersey uh, because the Belgian jersey looks like the Spain jersey. This is true. And I believe your uh, Spanish alter ego was Sergio. If I'm it, not I then became Sergio. I was Sergio for the rest of the night. Yes. So the, the whole night kind of seemed to be coming to a close. I was able to, you know, commandeer the phone number of said Russian 
female and she had offered to take Colin and I on with her friend on a riverboat cruise of the the Moscow what is the river the Moscow river the Moscow it's the Moscow the Moscow and that was to be early the next day and at this point it was lunch time lunch time yeah yeah so you know early whatever so we're getting on we say our goodbyes to everyone and we head back and we get off at our station and Colin and I are not necessarily done um with the night well, I'll just I'll just jump in real quick. You know, there there was a particular pub that we had seen, and we knew it would be our neighborhood pub, and we wanted to get to know it, and figured, ah, oh, why not just one more nightcap, and then we'll go to bed because we're going to go on this river cruise for lunch tomorrow. Exactly. And so this pub looked inviting. It seemed like it wanted to to have us belly up to it. And so we walk into this pub, and immediately are witness to a crew of incredibly intoxicated Englishmen. One of them is trying to steal the bulldog statue from out of the bar, and they were being escorted out. And I believe the bartender thought we were English. So we promptly corrected them and said, no, even though we did. No, we're Spanish. (laughs) I am Sergio. (laughs) I am Sergio. And sure enough, we struck a conversation with the bartender named Timothy, who was from Russia, from Moscow, and said, well, where in America are you from? And so Colin began to talk to him and say, well, I'm from New Jersey. And why don't you take it from there? Because this is your little stint. Well, yeah, you know, I mentioned that I grew up in New Jersey, um, you know, currently living in Colorado. And on that mention, he says, oh, I, you know, I spent many summers in New Jersey. And coming from New Jersey, it's kind of a joke. You know, everyone comes from Jersey, everyone leaves. That's why you can always go travel and find someone who's from New Jersey. Uh, but here we were in Russia, and this random bartender had spent time there living with family friends, he said, every summer. So I said, oh, and I, and I think I asked him, you know, where in New Jersey did you stay? And he says, of all places in New Jersey, you know, I was expecting like, you know, just outside of New York City or Hoboken or I don't know, down the shore. But he says a small town that no one ever mentions, and it happened to be the town I grew up in, Sicklerville. So my mind was just blown because it's probably actually the first time I ever heard someone mention very specifically that small town recalling their time in New Jersey. Anyone just knowing where it was in the first place would have been shocking. But to, to hear him say that he spent summers there was, was kind of wild. And I, I remember him saying, sick, sickler, sickler. <laughs> like he, he was like, so he knew it, but he didn't know it all the trying way. to find it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So obviously, you know, from there, it's like, phew, we're, we're hanging out with this guy. We're, ta- we're going to talk about it. We're going to recall stories and, and hear what his insights were on, or his opinions were on New Jersey and Sicklerville. And that conversation bleeds into the end of his shift. And at the end of his shift, he's worked a long day. He wants a drink. So he invites us out to the street because that's where local Russians drink on the street. And uh, we get through at least a half a bottle of vodka, I think. Um, can I can I have two small small little side stories, very quick ones? I forgot. Uh, you know, if we want this to be a four hour episode, but yeah, go for it. I'll make it very quick. One of them was the that drunk group of British people, uh, the guys. They were actually about to board a night train to oh yeah <laughs> to go see their team play their next city. Yeah, yeah, they were going to the Nizhny Novgorod. I don't remember how far away it was, but. I just remember one of the guys like, all right, lads, let's roll out. And it was like, whoa, you are not going to be getting on that train. And then other, uh, another fun little tidbit was I took a video call with our friend Steve, who was Mm. very, very close to pulling the trigger and flying out to Moscow that night to come Mm. hang out with us because we had extra tickets. Ah, yes. This could have been even more of an epic i don't even know how it could have been even more of an epic night but like we get through pretty much a half bottle of vodka on the street with timothy as the sun's coming up at 3 a.m because it's moscow night. very north very, very summertime yep so we're nearing 18 hours of drinking and somehow we are still upright and at this point at this point it's time to go to bed <laughs> That's what Colin thinks, but he's wrong. So Colin is ready to hit the hay. And I get a text message from our original wedding crew saying, hey, we're going out to a bar called I Like Wine and you should come meet up. 
So I'm like, yeah, we're doing that. I don't care. Well, we, we had a little bit of a tiff, I think, on the street where I was like, well, we need to go, you know, let's go get some sleep before we carry on with our day tomorrow for the, on this lunch cruise. And I think your exact words were, no, this, this is, is the day. This is the fucking day. <laughs> so we, I agreed. We went back to the Airbnb and changed clothes to get out of our jerseys from the day before. The Lord knows how much sweat we had poured into them throughout the, the 18 hours. And we, uh, we grabbed a taxi to I Like Wine. Mm -hmm. As the sun was just you know beaming into our eyeballs at, at 5 a.m. Uh, at, that, at that horizon level. It was, we were sloppy, they were sloppy, it was sloppy sloppy they were throwing the bouquet around to strangers who were walking to work <laughs> i <Yes>. mean <laughs> this was i think this it was this probably was a weekday it was it definitely was and it was just hysterical and yet it was not over this story no. just keeps going so so after i like wine after i like wine we end up at one of the most famous places in moscow for breakfasts uh, well, well, before before you get there, like we went because they said, "Oh, we need to go get some food and breakfast," and like that that sounded smart. Like mm -hmm. we should put some food in our stomachs before we fall asleep with all this alcohol. And oh, let's go to uh, we need to go to this cafe. To me, I'm thinking of like this little hole in the wall place, you know, this kind of comfort food breakfast stuff. But it turns out, Mike, as I, as I cut you off, you're about to tell us where it is. The I guess you could call it world famous cafe Pushkin in the heart of Moscow, quite famous. And, and very fancy. And it is very fancy. Like there were uh, waiters wearing bow ties and vests. Uh, I think there was actually like at least a four piece string, you know, quartet playing, you know, violin at, music at, in, the, in the back corner. At like 6 a.m. And yeah. they're serving the most delicacies you can imagine. I believe. What did you have? <laughs> well, I had some borscht because I really wanted some borscht because I just gotten there, but also some caviar. I had caviar and pancakes. Yes. <laughs> but let's not forget a lot of vodka as well. Blinny pancakes with caviar, you know, that's, that's together sense. with vodka at only 5 a.m. What time is it now? It was as if the meal was vodka breakfast with a side of caviar. Of course. And it just was opulent, I think is the word I would go for. That was a great word. And my level of behavior did not blend well with the, <laughs> the sophistication we... of this place. You all look so elegant. I feel like yeah. I'm doing something well, wrong. Idiots. Uh, I mean, the fact that the Brits borderline got kicked out, if not fully got kicked out of the, the kind of pub. dodgy pub, and we didn't get kicked out uh, of this fancy world-renowned Russian cafe. It probably helped that we were with, you know, two Russians. Yes. Uh, and a third and a that third. showed up, but that's, well, I'm not even going to get into that no. tangent of the story, but not worth it. Um, it, it that, that probably helped. Do you want to um, bring it home? Yeah. I mean, you know, the story really ends, you know, breakfast is over and, and we go home and we fall asleep at God knows like seven, 8 AM. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do not wake up until the night games are happening, you know, the next day. Which means we totally miss the plan for the Russian river boat cruise at lunch with the two friends we made the night before. So that, that was the greatest 24 hours I think we've ever had at a World Cup. But there's also been some really solid other moments. You know, maybe just one more would be the best experience soccer wise, football wise happening in South Africa. You know, the, the, the short version, the headline is Donovan Nets game winner in 90th minute. But the additional part of that story, Mike, involves a little bit of travel mishap and fun travel anecdote. So take it away from there a little bit and I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah, I mean, this is this match is the signature match of when our our roles as footy travelers traveling together probably got more solidified. Me getting caught up in the the hysteria with some drink and Colin some some drink, some yeah. and Colin just a bit just needing to play father figure and uh, and 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 take care of me and the situation. So, couple bullet points. 
in Pretoria, we see the arguably one of the greatest U.S. matches and experiences in U.S. men's soccer history. People may remember the call from Ian Dark. Oh, can you believe this? Go, go, USA! And uh, still gives me chills to this day. And it's the thing I brag about the most when it comes to football travel that I've been, I was at live the U.S.-Algeria match in South Africa. And we were not staying in Pretoria that evening. Uh, we were staying in Johannesburg, which is a um, car ride. And we had taken the train there, though. We, we got the train to there. We had taken the train there, looked at the train schedule of when it would be returning to Johannesburg, thought we were doing our due diligence in planning. I proceeded to do my due diligence in drinking and maybe delayed us getting to said train, but also not actually recognizing that I was reading the train schedule appropriately. Yeah, let me let me throw you a bone here. You know, we left the train station to go to the game with an intended return time to get the last train back. And once the game was over, I think your argument was, well, we have time. We even like took a picture of the train schedule mm-hmm. so that we didn't forget the time. Uh, but we have time to just go, just let's just go have a drink. Let's celebrate. We just witnessed an incredible victory. We're, we're through the round of 16. We can tie one more on and still make the train. So I was very to the train station. I must say, I was very convincing. I, I was convinced. I mean, you do, you do have a way of charming. <laughs> That's why I live in Charm City. Uh, my, my pants, ooh, my pants were still on, by the way, at the end of the night. <laughs> So you're not that charming, <laughs> but yeah, we get to the train and just, it's not showing up. So we go ask someone, we show them the schedule, like we're waiting for this train and they say something like, oh, well, no, that's the, that's the 715 train. And we're like, yeah, it's 720. Where is it? And they're like, no, that's 715. Right now, the time is 1921. <laughs> So everything was on military time. We were looking at the complete wrong section of the schedule. Uh, And since then, uh, all of my clocks and watches have been on military time. And mine. And we are somewhat seasoned travelers in countries that do have military time. So for some reason, we just completely forgot about that fact. So long- Shame on us. Long story, long story quite short, Colin somehow- finds a way to get us a ride back to Johannesburg via a police officer. Oh, uh, what? I'll back you up. We, we actually, we, we managed to make our way to the police station. Oh, sorry. See, this is where- To try to, to, try to find some help in getting us back. A little fuzzy. Uh, all, the ta- all the taxis were like exorbitant. So we, we kind of like just rested. Mike may or may not have passed out in a South African police station for a few hours. <laughs> um, eventually, a, a reasonable priced taxi. Um, was able to be arranged and we, we just got it right back uh, probably as the sun was coming up there too so this is true all all ends well uh when the next day arrives with the sun for us at world cups this so. is true and here we are getting ready to go to qatar it's 2022 <laughs> honestly i really hope we don't have as many fun stories uh involving drinking coming out of qatar because i i don't think they'll be all that fun if they're as as uh and i would as say as wild as some of our other stories i would say hopefully fewer encounters with uh authority figures police yeah yeah that'd be oh, good that would be good yeah i mean maybe not running from the police like i did in south africa too that that would be nice mm. to not do that in qatar so let's let's not do that let's add that to the list um but what's uh what's our what's our world cup in Qatar, shaping up like, what's it looking like? Uh, talk to me a little bit about our, our tickets first, you know, the, the bread and butter of any World Cup trip. So we've got two four game packages, which I'm very excited about. We've got four matches with the team specific for following the United States men's team. Uh, so the three group stage matches and then the one knockout stage if they advance. And then four match tickets that are stadium specific which we wanted to stadium stadium series, excuse me, stadium series. Yes. So that is a new, uh, if you listen to an earlier episode of our show in the need to know series, we talk about all the stadiums and some of the packages that they have. And this is the first world cup that they're doing a stadium series where you can go to a variety of different stadiums. That's the benefit of hosting the world cup in a country as big as Connecticut. You can get to a lot of stadiums with eight brand new stadiums that they want all the people to go to. So, we are uh, in for for some from very exciting matches, and 
I think the most notable one being the Black Friday, the Battle of Black Friday, uh, England versus US. And we are still currently open to looking for some other tickets available. If we want to see, I would like to see a match at Lucille, the signature stadium that's hosting the final. But I think we have a, a very good uh, agenda ahead of us. Speaking of agendas, I'll bring it full circle to the teaser at the top of the episode. We have our tickets. We have our accommodation. We have our flights. We have flight itineraries. But we might be changing some of that because several weeks ago, after Mike and I signed up for a 5v5 tournament that American Outlaws was organizing, maybe they weren't organizing the tournament, but they were organizing the US representation in this little 5v5 fan tournament. Uh, we got more communication from them that because we signed up for that 5v5 tournament, we were then nominated to participate in the American Fan Leader Delegation. And that may or may not be the official title, but Essentially, we have been offered the opportunity to attend the opening match, which includes attending the opening ceremony. In and of itself, a phenomenal opportunity. But with that, they are also offering, and I guess when I say they, I mean the organizing committee, the Supreme Committee for Legacy and whatever delivery. you want to call it in Qatar, and delivery. They're offering flights and accommodation for those people in these different countries, fan leader delegations. So still waiting on details for that. As of this recording, a little ahead of November, you're hearing it in the future, listeners. You're in the future. The future. But still not sure what's going to happen. So in some of our later episodes, you know, we'll be sure to let you know how that turned out. Uh, maybe we'll have a full episode on the whole experience of having the organizing committee fly you out for the opening match and opening ceremony. So I've, I'm one to exaggerate, and with this vague amount of information, or lack thereof, I've just took it upon myself to say that we are part of the opening ceremony. So, mm, mm -hmm. you know, walking on the pitch, I, I imagine wearing some Ralph Lauren, like an Olympics opening ceremony, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fantasizing about this, uh, not only because flights and accommodation are paid for, but because... I might be able to say that I'm part of the opening ceremony for this World Cup. So by the time you all listen to this, maybe you will want to actually watch the opening ceremony and keep it, your eyes peeled for seeing Colin and I, maybe. We'll be rocking some, uh, s well, we actually don't know what we'll be rocking because who knows, maybe we'll have to sign away all of our rights to choose our own attire and wear some crappy t-shirts that promote Qatar and FIFA. And honestly, if that's the case... I'd I'd gracefully just bow out and say no thanks if I can, you know, and, and maybe maybe I can, maybe I can at that point. A uh, lot of, like Mike said, a lot of information still to come. Has me a little bit nervous, I guess, but also excited. You know, it's this World Cup has definitely been a bag of mixed emotions. Yeah, a lot of moral dilemma going on. Not that we're surprised about that, but a bit of a roller coaster before we even get there. So hopefully it'll flatten out. A little bit when we get there because the amount of ups and downs we've got going on right now are i guess there's a lot of ups not many downs but uh i think this is a pretty great opportunity for the footy travelers and uh if you do want to bow out then we'll we'll do a very fun episode of my experience being part of the opening ceremony and your experience not being a part of it and that's fine and maybe my section of that episode will be recorded from a, a qatari jail i don't know <laughs> Well, you know, this is investigative investigative journalism over here. Oh, this is this is so not journalism. <laughs> well, here we go. It's World Cup time, everyone. It's here in a few days. Get ready. Mike and I are stoked. We'll be looking to bring you episodes that include other footy travelers from around the world. So stay tuned for what that looks like. More to come in the coming days. Let's go ahead and also make a bit of an announcement here for our loyal listeners. There will certainly be more to come on our Instagram account on this, but as of tonight in this recording, Mike and I have in hand several Footy Travelers kits, jerseys, if you will. And they are beautiful. They are beautiful. Mike has seen them with his own eyes. <laughs> I've designed them with my own eyes too. You did. And that great brain of yours. <laughs> now you may remember from a previous episode Emily Agata from the Craig Willinger Fund. 
The Craig Willinger Fund has graciously agreed to be our inaugural shirt sponsor. And so with that relationship, more details to come, but Footy Travelers kits, jerseys, will be for sale in the coming days and months. Part of the proceeds from those will go to the Craig Willinger Fund, who makes soccer dreams come true for kids with cancer and other terminal illnesses. So if you want to support soccer dreams, footy travel, but more importantly, some really deserving kids, keep an eye out and consider purchasing one of our jerseys. You're not only going to look fashionable, you're going to be doing a very, very good deed for an incredibly good and just cause. Aside from that, we hope you're as stoked as we are. Mike, any last minute parting words? I'm speechless. Well, save that voice because we're going to be doing a lot of shouting. Go, go, USA. Because I'm going to be loud and I'm going to be proud. Be loud, be proud, and be good to each other. The Footy Travelers Podcast is a production of Fiper Media. To learn more about their other work, visit FiperMedia.com. That's F-Y-P-E-R Media.com. Our episodes are edited by me, Colin Martin. Mike Tyrone is our creative director. Cover art is by Felix Palau. Theme music comes from Shumatar, with additional music from Mr. Mastermind. Our incredible intro voice is Helen My Mars. You can keep up with all things footy travel by following us on Instagram, at footy travelers. We'll see you next time.